Hi there, I'm Julia Minamata. Welcome to my workshop on Adventure Game Studio. If you're interested in making your own adventure game for hobby or for commercial release, Adventure Game Studio is a really good option for that. In this workshop, I'm going to be showing the basics of everything you'd need to build your own adventure game and giving you like the disadvantages and the advantages of using this particular engine and some examples of, of games that you can check out on your own to see what it what other people have built using that. And let's get started. Let's get right into it. This is my game, The Crimson Diamond, and this is, yes indeed, I am using Adventure Game Studio to build this. It is my first game that I'm developing and releasing in 2024. It's my first game ever. And I approached it from a very rookie standpoint. I am a self-taught programmer, um, which means that I had a lot of learning to do to, to, to get to the stage that I'm at right now in development. But Adventure Game Studio has actually been really wonderful in terms of having um, extensive documentation in the engine. It had, there's a wiki for it as well. There are active forums, Adventure Game Studio forums that you can find on their site. And there's a very active Discord. This software was originally released in 1997, but it has been updated and maintained by a really passionate Adventure Game community since then. Um, that's definitely one of the advantages. Um, also, because it's it's been around, it there are tons of tutorials. Um, I learned um, um, from a YouTube tutorial how to use the basics of Adventure Game Studio. And that was like a 40 part series. This is an hour and a half long workshop. We're gonna move really super fast through this, but um, just in case, if I move a bit too fast um, and you find that you're missing steps, definitely you can check out other people's YouTube tutorials if if that's more your speed, because that's how I learned. Hopefully you guys can you can, guys can come up with some some valuable learning from this particular workshop and this will be enough to get you um, to show you the ropes. I mentioned, um, yeah, there are advantages. This this is an open source freeware software. It uh, it doesn't uh, have any you don't have to license it. You don't have any type of that type of consideration. Like there's no licensing tiers if you want to release your game commercially. There are some considerations for releasing your game commercially, but there's a link to a page that will show you everything you need to think about. So so don't worry about that. It's not too it's not too um, complicated to release games commercially in this um, in this particular engine. Um, and if you have really specific questions, you can either address the Discord or the forums. Or maybe ask one of these developers who have who have done just that. This is a selection of games that have been commercially released in, uh, using Adventure Game Studio. There's the Excavation of Hobbs Barrow, Mage's Initiation, Lamplight City, Feria Darls, Guard Duty, Beyond the Edge of Algard, Nelly Kudalot the Foul Fleet, and Perfect Tides. I could recommend any of these ones to show the different types of things that, that are possible in, in this engine. That's how I was inspired initially when I started making my game was seeing what was possible. And these are really, really wonderful examples of that. There are disadvantages to using Adventure Game Studio. And one of them is that it's because it was made in 1997 initially, and there is not, um, there is not a very clear path for porting your game to console like Switch or Xbox or something like that. That doesn't mean it's impossible. It just takes a little bit more work than using some other adventure game engines that have that are like more modernly developed. That's definitely a, a big disadvantage to Adventure Game Studio. And it's also because of the, the, the way that the, the programming is done for the engine. Um, when you update your game and fix it with patches and stuff, um, it, your, the, the player save games can be, uh, can be uh, unplayable, I guess will break. You'll break your your player C games, which which no one likes. But I I feel like I need to, to 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 list those two things. Those are the two biggest disadvantages I would say for the engine. But for me, the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. Which is yeah, that community and the fact that you don't have to deal with like tiers of licensing, and and uh, any type of licensing really, or particularly strict end user agreements or things like that when using the software. It's also really lightweight. You don't need a top of the line computer and many gigabytes of space to run Adventure Game Studio, which is also really wonderful and makes it a lot more approachable for people who are just starting out. 
uh, I have a um, this uh, this slide is the different templates that Adventure Game Studio comes with, and definitely one of the the advantages to using a purpose built engine for adventure games is it comes loaded up with already so many things that it will make your life as an adventure game creator so much easier. These templates represent basic styles of user interface for adventure game studios, uh, ad adventure games, and um, definitely check these games out if you want to see those interfaces in action. Uh, Beneath the Steel Sky um, is the BAS, uh, S, BASS template there, where the in interactions are done with the left and right, right, right mouse clicking. The left mouse click will execute an action and the right mouse click is for looking. Uh, upper right is the Sierra interface, the template, which is right click cycles through different types of actions you can perform. Left click executes those actions. If you move your mouse button up to the top of the screen, a menu bar comes down. And that's This is the template that we'll be using for this workshop. Bottom left is Tumbleweed, which is the Thimbleweed Park user interface, which is verbs along the bottom of the screen that you can click on and then click on an area of interest on the screen to execute a command. Um, the Curse of Monkey Ireland is the bottom right corner example for the verb coin interface, which is clicking on a point of interest, which brings up this yeah, literally in Mon in the Curse of Monkey Island, a gold coin that that gives you a bunch of different actions that you could potentially perform. All these games are really wonderful games. Definitely recommend checking them out. Beneath the Steel Sky is free on GOG, um, which makes it absolutely perfect if you want to see what is possible with this partic that particular interface. Uh, yeah, let's get into it. Let's take a look at that. What that all what that all means. Let's put it all together. Let's get started. Um, yeah, just as a note. I am recording this all in one take because I'm not a video editor. So apologies if this if I stumble a little bit here and there, but we're going to get through this. We got a lot to get going. So I'm going to change my screen over to my screen view and we're going to launch uh, Adventure Game Studio 3.6. OK, when you first launch Adventure Game Studio, you get this dialog box and you can start a new game from here. And if you do, you get this new game wizard which lists those templates that I mentioned before. The BASS, the Beneath the Steel Sky template. Sierra, em empty game doesn't come with assets in it. Sierra style, which is what we'll be looking at. Tumbleweed, which is um, the Thimbleweed Park example. And Verb Coin, which is kind of like the Curse of Monkey Island. But let let's get started with that Sierra style. We need to call it something. So we're going to call this um, our workshop. Our workshop. Okay. And here we go. This this is an integrated development environment, which is also really helpful for, for beginners. It's everything is kind of visually set out really nicely and organized. You can see along the, the right hand side there's the explore project window, which has everything, all the elements that we're going to be looking at today to build an adventure game. But first, let's let's launch what the template has uh, in store for us so far um, for the Sierra style template. And what we have here is you've got a character, you've got a cursor, you've got the name of our game along the top, our workshop, and we have zero points. OK, we can click left click around the screen to walk in the areas that have been designated by the program. Right clicking cycles through different abilities. Like this is the examine ability. You can rub your hands up and down your clothes, interact. You can talk, try talking to yourself at least. And yeah, you move your cursor up to the top and you have this wonderful interface already prepared for you that has saving and loading, which is also wonderful if um, yeah you're, you're a beginner and you don't know how to program a save and load save or load functions. I still don't know how to do that because Adventure Game Studio has done that for me, which is which is wonderfully helpful. And um, yeah, options here, um, uh, volume, all the rest of that, all these basic default settings that you'd want in your game anyway, yeah, are already here, which is very, very, very helpful and time saving. And we have some in we have some inter uh, inventory items here, another hallmark of it of many an adventure game. But a lot of the stuff does not have very much functionality. We can't look through any of this stuff yet. But uh, we'll, I'll show you how to build all that stuff in. Let's close this window and start taking a tour of all the, uh, well, not all of them, actually, 
um, some of these different settings here. There's general settings, which has a bunch of different options that lets you select how speech will be handled and the name of everything. We're not going to go through this stuff. We're just going to get right into building stuff. If you want to close a tab, you can right click it and close it, or you can use control W as a shortcut. Let us look, let's first, colors is, is I think pretty self-explanatory. It has, there's a color palette and you've got these different colors here and they actually have index numbers, which we will, we will be using. So this is actually sometimes helpful to refer to, but we're not gonna need that for a little bit. So let's use control W to close that tab. The next option here to look at is sprites. The empty template does not come with any um, assets in it, but uh, all the other templates do come with some wonderful sprites. This is, the character here, all the views of the character, you can see all the di directions that Roger, his name is, a Roger can walk, as well as those inventory items that we saw. It also has yeah, the, the menu, menu bar and all the different mouse states, like um, default and mouse over, click, and all the rest of it. These you can replace. If I was to right click one of these sprites, you can edit the image in your, Im Im your image editor. That is your default image editor, I guess, which would be defined by your operating system. You can copy the sprite to a clipboard and then paste it and then edit it in your, your software that way. You can export it. You can replace the sprite from files. So this would be a way to reskin all of these user interfaces, which is very handy. The text box is, yeah, the corners and the middle bits of the, that text box we saw that, that displayed the messages that we we, um, we, um, we we brought up, I guess, when we interacted with the game. UI, other UI bits like windows and things, and the cursors, which also can be, of course, everything can be reskinned here, which is very helpful. The next thing here is the text parser. And Unfortunately, we won't have time in this particular workshop to deal with the, with the text parser. The template that we're using right now is um, point and click, basically. It's, it's mouse only. Um, and ironically, the game I'm making is a text parser game, but we just simply do not have time to go over this stuff. Maybe in a future workshop, I can show you guys the text parser because I'm very passionate about that as a user interface. Um, but moving on. Lip sync, yeah, lip sync is the second of three things that I will not be going through um, in this workshop. A, because, yeah, we have a bit of a, a time limit here. B, because my own game does not have voice acting, which means I have not needed to use this um, part of the engine. Um, so I could not even begin to explain it. But I'm sure there is tutorials uh, uh, to show this if you do want to have voice acting in your game, for instance. The GUIs is, yeah, the, the graphical user interfaces. This is all that stuff we have seen in the game already, the menu bars and all the rest of it. And these are, these kind of um, show how these are all organized. Um, and of course, if we click on one of these, we can see over here in the properties area underneath the, the explore project window, we can see a bunch of different properties for that first button that I clicked, which is that, that shoe button. We can see that it, yeah, it has an image and that was, that's des designated as Sprite 2100 which when we go to back to the sprites and we look for sprite 2100, we can right click find sprite by number 2100 is indeed this, that shoe button. If we were to change that to 21, 2101, which is what the next one is, you can see that it does change color. Um, so we can do that here. Or we can use these um, three dots here to find um, a different icon that we might want to use. But we don't want to, we want to, well, I'm going to move that, revert that back to the old one. Okay. The next thing we're going to be looking at is um, yeah, inventory items. And here they are. There's a bunch of different things we can look at here. That this, this is the sprite, of course, which is defined by the this sprite number here. And it's got a name. Um, something you might know, have noticed in the way things are named is this inventory item has a lowercase i associated with it first before the name of the actual item. And in the GUIs, the uh, the GUIs have a small g. This is this is just a naming convention. It will still, everything will still work if you don't name things like this, but naming them this way is just makes things a lot easier to identify and organize for, for later. So that's just a quality of life thing to consider. Um, but yeah, we are actually, uh, yeah, the dialogues, there's no dialogues in this game yet, but we will be adding one the views of the character um, this is for animations 
And yeah, you can see that we have um, the different the different loops here. The first one loop is loop down, which means as the character moves down on the screen, what to what they'll look like. Left, right, and the rest of it. We can actually preview that animation to get an idea of what he looks like in all those aspects, which is which is kind of handy. And characters. We only have one character, which is our fellow here. And you can see he's got a number, a few things here. He's got um, just something, something that immediately jumps out is the speech color. That's the color of his the dialogue that he'll say on screen. And his view, his normal view is view one, which happens to be this view that we were looking at together. And that is a way to define how he would look in in his movement. There are other views here, this blinking view. This is more like if you have like speech portraits in your game where you have a close up of someone's face and they're talking, what they would look like if they're if they're if they're blinking or speaking and, and things like that. Speech animation delay, all these settings. We're not gonna get into those. We're just gonna deal with um that this um this particular game as it is now. But yeah, you can definitely get into this stuff. But to this this particular style of interface doesn't really deal with that. He's got movement speed, all this stuff. Um, and all these things are pretty self-explanatory. What's helpful is you can click on them and it does uh, each time you do click on one, there is often a further explanation that appears below, which is really nice. Mouse cursors, yeah, this is also something that's like, also pretty self-explanatory, I think, where you have, we've defined what the mouse cursor is with the particular sprite that we saw in the sprite tab here. We're not going to have to deal with those. I'm just closing some of these tabs to keep things a bit neater. Uh, fonts. Fonts is something, um, if this game, uh, the template comes with three fonts, this normal font, speech font, and speech outline font. One thing to keep in mind for the uh, commercially released games is you will need to replace speech font and speech outline font with other fonts because they were taken from a Space Quest game. And if you want to be super careful legally, you might want to replace those. This normal font, though, is, is usable because it was designed by someone who works in Adventure Game Studio. I have actually created my own font. You can you can create um, like true type fonts and other other formats as well, um, and uh, just load them up in here, which is which is really nice. You can see import over this font. Um, very 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 nice feature. There is no there's no audio in the template yet, but we will be adding our own sound, and I'll show you how to implement that. Global variables we won't be looking th at this either. Um, the global vari variables basically are things that you need you need to keep track of across all the rooms in the game. Um, so let's say if you've picked up an item in one room, the character it's relevant in in another room, so we need to track whether that item has been picked up or not. Stuff like that. Um, that's that that's a bad example, but it is an example, so we're gonna, just going to go with that. The scripts. Um, I mentioned that there are mod things called modules and plugins that help um, extend the functionality of the Adventure Game Studio engine. And the template does come with a module um, that's called the Keyboard Movement Module. And if we take a look at this and open it up, um, it is, uh, it's got a, an author, Rui Brisby Pyers of the AGS team, Strazer. Uh, descriptions allows to, move, allows to move the character using the keyboard. And yeah, this type of thing is also something to keep in mind um, if you are going to be commercially releasing the game and you're going to have credits, um, sometimes you're going to need or want to credit the people who are involved in the modules that you might include in your game. And plugins, plugin, plugins is the third thing that I can't explain because I, as I mentioned, everything I've ever wanted to do in an adventure game, I can do in the current version of Adventure Game Studio, but that is just another more advanced way, I think, to, to add functionality to this engine. And rooms. Rooms is the last thing we're going to get into. Oh, there's four things I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about translations. My game is not localized, uh, so I don't know how that works. But again, uh, the documentation in, in, the, um, in the, the actual engine, which we will look at briefly to see what that looks like, the documentation, and as well, um, the wiki would help. But let's look at that room. We, uh, we've, when we launched the room, this is, this is what it looks like. And it's got a bunch of different features in it that we can deal with, and we're going to get started on that. Basically now, yes, now. This is the main background for this room. You can see I can up, I can import other backgrounds. I, I believe um, you can up, um, import up to four backgrounds, and this is a really nice way to have an animated background. 
The template does not come with an, any other backgrounds, but I've actually taken it upon myself to um, create um, another background to show you what the animation looks like. And if we've got a little dialogue here about if you import extra backgrounds into this room, it's used for switching backgrounds or creating a full-size background animation. And yes, this is what I want to do. And I have, oh, our workshop documents, documents. Okay. I have that under a uh, workshop room two, I think is what I called it. I hope. Yes, uh, that is what it is. Okay. And it's a very, you can see I've done a very subtle change here. Just a, a bit of glow around that orb that's in the middle of the screen and the water. Just, I just moved a few pixels around here and there to achieve that effect. Well, let's launch the game and see what that actually looks like. It's our first thing that we've changed in, in the template so far. Okay. Now here we are. And we can see, lo and behold, there is a background animation that is actually going kind of fast. Like faster than I would like it to go. Which, of course, like just about everything else, can be adjusted. If we go over to the properties panel on the left hand on the right hand side, we can see if we scroll down, you can find background animation delay. Currently it's at five, which is too fast. I'm gonna set that at, at 30 and see what that looks like. You can also enable or disable this background animation with true or false, which is very nice. But launching this, let's take a look. And now that is much slower of an animation. I think that's just more, more, um, less distracting. How about that? Less distracting. Okay. The next thing we're going to look at is, um, all this stuff here. So this is all the room stuff that we're going to be changing and adjusting. The first one is edges and the edges of a room is kind of an easy way to have the player move from one room to the other and designate the boundaries of what that room are going to be. There's a left edge, a right edge, a bottom edge, and a top edge here. And each of these, we can associate um, certain interactions with it. Um, and interactions are done here in this events lightning bolt button. So I press that button. This room has a bunch of different things we can do. And one of them is what happens when, when we walk off the left edge, which is that, yeah, the left edge is here that I've just clicked and dragged over. And what we're going to want to do probably is have him, the character Roger, move to the left-hand room. Well, there isn't a left-hand room yet, but I can I can add one, and which uh, which is what I'm going to do now. Let us create a new room, blank room, room number two. In the properties area of the properties pane, we can give it a description, so we can call this workshop room. If you, oh, or you can even spell it right if you want. Okay. Oh, well, I, I, whoops. Now I've um, done it to the wrong one. Okay. Wait, don't call this one workshop room. I want to call room two workshop room. So I'm going to edit this room by double clicking, save changes on this room before closing it. You can notice sometimes I, when I start changing some of the settings, um, in rooms, you get this asterisk beside the tab. And that means that there's an unsaved change. We're going to say yes. And that's going to get rid of that asterisk and open up the next room. We can only edit one room at a time. I'm going to call this workshop room and you can see it does update the name right there. We're going to need a main background for this room. So let's change to, to create a main background for this room. And I do have workshop room two already, um, an asset that I've prepared. Oh, that's not the right one. Change. Uh, it is room workshop. Okay. Alternate. There it is. Okay. And here's my alternate room too, which I just basically uh, changed the colors on and give it a nice clear label. So we know that it's a different room and I'm going to save. Um, you can save either by using this diskette <laughs> button. You can tell how old this engine is because it uses this diskette icon as a save icon. Um, I can press that to save the changes on this room, or I can press control S as the shortcut, or I can go up to file and save, uh, oh, control S save. Okay, we're well, going back to room one. We're going to say, okay, you're going to walk off the left edge of this room and we want something to happen. We walk off the left edge of the room. Okay, I'm going to click this, these three dots along the bottom here. And we're going to get this. This is going to be created in room one and it's a function. Our first function, which is room underscore leave left. And we need some parameters for that. Well, we said, well, if I want if I want the character to move, I need to designate what is moving. 
And the character's name is C. Ego. If we open up his um, C, small, small case, lowercase C for character. Script name is C. Ego. That's how we're going to refer to him. We want C. Ego. And this is wonderful because you can see that there's a, a, a menu that pop, auto populates here. We want C. Ego to change rooms. And we want him to change into to room two. We also need to have optional X and Y coordinates and optional character direction. Okay. Which, if we don't, if we don't define those, he'll just end up, I guess, somewhere. Which I actually don't know where he's going to end up. So why don't we find out together? Okay. Here he is. He's going to walk off this left edge. Okay, we definitely don't want him ending up here because it won't give the it does not give the illusion that he's coming from the right of this room. We're going to need to, to define x and y coordinates. And for this room, because our rooms are basically the same room, we don't have to open up that other room to check what the coordinates might be. But um, it's just a bit of a <laughs> a shortcut that no one else is going to be able to use, so that's not particularly useful. But it's a time saver. As you as I move this mouse cursor around in this room, you can see that the mouse coordinates are changing and updating to show me what the X value and the Y value is of the mouse's position. And I'm moving the character to the left hand side, going to a room that's supposed to be on the left hand side of him. I want him to appear on the right hand side of the screen so that it looks like he's been moved from place to place. And let's see, 259, 150 so it seems like a pretty good area for him to show up. I'm going to go to room one script and I want the X to be 259, the Y to be 150. And I can also define which direction he'll be facing. He is kind of already facing the correct direction, but let's just for just the sake of an example, give a different direction. Say, okay, I want him to face down, which is toward us. Let's see what that looks like. Here he goes moving to the left. This is room one. He's going to move into room two. And there he is. And I've, I've told him to face toward us, facing down, and, and there he is. Um, unfortunately, he cannot walk around in this room because we haven't defined the walkable area in this room, which we will get into. Let's see here. I can... You can, uh, you can have a bunch of things uh, displaying at once. So I can toggle this, the visibility of the edges on and off. But yeah, let's look at let's skip ahead to walkable areas because those two kind of things kind of work together. It's really important that the walkable area intersects with this room edge. If I had had this room edge out here beyond this this gray area, or actually it's it's actually um it's actually a uh, blue area as defined here. But yeah, if these two don't inter interact, then Roger cannot hit that edge of the room and then trigger the changing changing a room event. Um, that's something that is important when you're when you're troubleshooting your game if something's not working properly. It's stuff like this is some this is really important to check. But we did indeed do that for this room. Um, but yeah let me just move this edge back over here so he can interact with that left edge and then move to the other room. Let's just save I'm going to open up the, the our, our second room, which does not have any walkable areas. And we're going to build our own walkable area. And there's a number of tools for this. I'm going to just um, zoom in a little bit. Along the top here, we have um, this line tool, which is what you can use. Oh, I need to, to choose a walkable area to define along the, the right hand side here. There are 15 walkable areas that you can define per room. I'm going to define walkable area one. And using this line tool, I can click and drag and release to create lines. And then I can enclose shapes and use this bucket tool to fill that shape. There's also a freehand tool, which you can use to click and drag to create irregular shapes and then fill them if you've created a closed shape. And there's a rectangle tool that will do the same thing, clicking and dragging rectangles. And if you want to erase any aspect of these um, these shapes, you need to right click and drag to erase. So that is erasing the rectangle, right click and drag, right click and drag. The freehand tool will carve out of the shape you've already defined. And yeah, right clicking and dragging the linear tool will create 
um, erase, erasures, linear erasures. But uh, I'm going to use the, the rectangle tool to just quickly erase all that again. And I can define using a rectangle tool the, the area that I want. And that's, that could be done this way. I don't want to be too careful. We're going to have Roger be able to walk through this area. And another thing we need to think about is when he changes to this room, we want him to land on a walkable area. Because if he's not, he won't be able to go anywhere. Um, let's see here. So this walkable area has an area of two, 258 to 152. Let's see. I want to move the character to 258 to 152 to be on the safe side. Let's see what that looks like. Here, we, here he is. We walk him over to the left. And now Roger can walk, but only in the area, that dark blue area that we defined. He cannot walk across this entire area unless we let him do that, unless we define that. So those are walkable areas. Let's move on to the next um, room feature here. I'm going to turn off the edges because we're not going to deal with those right now. The next um, room feature that I, I do want to talk about is that kind of goes hand in hand with walkable areas is walk behinds. And this room, when I turn on the walk behinds, um, Oh, wait, and then select them. Not only do you have to turn them on visually, but you actually have to select clicking act the actual name of them. There are a total of 15 walk behinds in this room as well, um, but they're none defined. We're going to define walkable area number one. And I think it would be kind of neat that Roger, if Roger could walk behind this, this um, shape. And I could try defining this with these shape tools that I've already talked about, where I can freehand areas and then fill them, which I, oh, well, the, oh, you get one undo step, by the way. That's what this red, uh, this, uh, this green arrow is. It's control Z to undo, but you only get one undo step. So clearly I did not enclose this entire shape, um, but I don't know where I, I didn't. You can, you can take the time to do this, but you can also, if you want to use your own, um, your own image editing software to create these layer masks. That's that's absolutely possible because we have this option here, import mask from file. And I'm going to quickly, I'm going to import a mask for this room that I've already created. And it's here, workshop room masks. And you can see that not only do I have a perfectly delineated walkable area for this, this stone bit, but I've also, as just as an example, Let's select these areas. Created a second walkable area, just as an example. And walkable area one and walkable area two have very specific colors. And walk behind, I so walk behind areas one and two have very specific colors, which are the same colors as the walkable area one, walkable area two, and all the rest of that. And that's where these colors come in. Uh, when I mentioned that we'd be referring back to these colors, walkable area one is index one, as you can see on the far right hand side here under appearance, color, color type, design, index one. And index two is the color of, of dark green, which is something uh, very important to keep in mind if you're going to be making your own, um, your own wa uh, walkable masks, like either walk behinds or um, even regions, which also have a 15 region limit and uh, walkable areas, walk behinds. When you want to create your own mask that you can then import, you're going to need to create, um, this is a 320 by 200 um, document. So you're going to want to create one of those and then have the background color that won't be detected black, which is um, this color, the first color here, which is index zero. And you can see here, the color is listed in RGB values, red, green, blue values. So this dark blue, um, you're going to want to use in, in your, your whatever image editing software you're using. Zero red, zero green, and 168 blue. Um, and for the black, you're going to want zero, zero, zero. The background of your 320 by 200 pixel mask, if you're going to be using your, you're making your own elsewhere, um, needs to be black. And then you can then draw these masks in the particular colors as defined in this palette up to um up to 15 because this is a 16 this is 16 row this is a row of 16 but zero is red as transparent 
Um, but yeah, that I, and actually I can show you what that looks like by just importing that document, uh, that sprite into the sprite folder. Um, just, just to show you because um, you might require a visual to get a better idea. Okay, wow, workshop masks room yeah, and they have to be BMP files as well to work as um, bitmap files to work as masks. But yeah, here is what it actually looks like. Um, you can see this is um, 320 by 200 um, area and um, I've got that particular blue drawn out and then the green. And then when I import this, the black is the transparent um, part of it. Just as just to show that as an example, and of course, when you actually do the layer mask, you would be, um, you wouldn't just be doing that from I. You would actually be taking the main background of this room, exporting it into your image file, into your image editing software, and then you know doing a transparent layer and painting on top of a new layer, and then filling that background with black. Hopefully, I was able to explain that well enough. Um, but yeah, let us move on to uh, characters. The character um, of Roger does start in a very specific area of the screen. Um, if I go back to his uh, properties here by double clicking him as a character over here and looking down at, at to this particular property, which is starting room, he has a uh, starting room of one. Now that we've created a second room, you can see that now we've got, he could start in room two, which has been designated and named as workshop room. And also there are X and Y values here for where he starts in that room. And when you launch a game, that is where the game will start. If I was to take Roger and move him around and then go back to that character, um, that character tab, these coordinates have now changed to move him to be where I just moved him in the room. And you can also go back and change the coordinates here and then have him, he has shifted back. Um, so either place you can change that property and then have that update in the other place. That's the that's for the characters. We only have one character, but we will be creating a new character. Um, which yeah, why don't we we can do that now because I mentioned we needed to create a new character so he has someone to talk to. I can show the the dialogue option um, in Adventure Game Studio. I'm going to go over to the right hand side here. I'm going to right click the word characters and I'm going to create a new character. The new character, it looks a lot like the old character, um, which we don't want. That's, that would be much too confusing. I'm going to change, um, I need to change the view of this character to make it reflected here. In order to do that, I need to have a new view. But in order to have a new view, I'm going to need to have a new sprite for this new view. So let's go to back to sprites and let's go to defaults and I'm going to in, in, import a new character sprite that I have laboriously prepared which is this which is just a um, inverted version of Roger there are some options here for importing a sprite you can import an alpha channel which means transparency if available which um, I'm not really using transparency here so that's not something I need to consider you can remap the character to the your current color palette in an 8-bit image only, which I don't think is I don't think is really relevant here either, because I don't think this is an 8-bit game. Um, but I could be wrong. We don't need any any of that stuff. But it's it's fine if we leave this on too. That doesn't really if that won't really affect anything. Transparent color. Now this is going to be important because we probably we probably don't want this this rectangle around around the character. But let's we let's see if we leave him as is and click import. We can see that, yes, indeed, there is, that uh, he has got this green rectangle around him. If we were to create a new view for this new character, uh, I'm not going to, I can, I guess I could, I'm not really going to name it anything. I'm going to create a new loop, and you can create a new frame, and when you click on the frame, you can designate what image that frame will be. And for me, it's going to be our new guy here. Okay. Great. And then I'm going to add him to this area here. So I'm going to double click. Oh, see, care. you know what? I should give him a name. I'm going to call him not Roger. And he's going to start have a starting room. If he doesn't have a starting room, then he, he's not going to show up anywhere. But I'm going to designate his starting room as room one. And then I'm also going to change his speech color because 
we don't really want for clear for clarity's sake we don't want his speech color to be the same color as roger's speech color i'm going to choose this nice cyan color which is index color 11. let us change that to 11 which as you can see has already updated to that that beautiful cyan color if i go back to this room oh and i forgot to change his view never mind uh, one more thing step is i need to change his normal view to view two which is which is our not roger view so let's use this view and if we go to room one we can see here it is not roger and we can set him down over here on the walkable area if we were to launch this you will see that yeah it's not <laughs> we don't really want that that rectangle around around not roger what we can do is we can go back to our sprite we can right click that sprite and we can replace that sprite from the from file which means we can just pick the same one and then we have we can use one of these options which is transparent color can be top left bottom left top right bottom right or palette index zero well we want the green to be gone and luckily for us all the corners have that green color we can pick any of these corners with us go with top left if we import He's got now a hot pink background, but the thing, the thing about Adventure Game Studio is the hot pink background here is going to show as transparent here. It's going to be invisible. And when we start that game, he will now look kind of better and sitting in that scene like that. Let's take a look at uh, how we could possibly talk to him, because if we to, were to start this up now, uh, there will be no interaction because we certainly have not programmed any interaction. So clicking on him will do nothing. Oh, it says here new character too. We can change that. Let's change that really quickly. Going back to C. Roger, his real name, we can say not Roger. Okay. We're going to need to add an interaction to him. And what we can do is we can add an event. And if we were going to talk to character, we can talk to character here. If I click on those three three dots, we can see in the global script, we get this new function called C not Roger underscore talk, which means that if these characters were to meet up in a different room and our character was to talk to not Roger, then it would this interaction would still work, which is really important. It's not just to do with this room. This 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 goes for any room that these two characters find themselves in. Okay, well we need to talk. We need a dialogue. Like we're going to start a new dialogue here. By right clicking the dialogue and creating a new dialogue and here we are here's the start the dialogue entry point we can have our character who is actually called in the scripts ego c ego colon this is the convention for writing scripts we can say hello and then we can have c not roger reply with hiya let's see what that looks like Oh, you know what? It's not going to look like anything because I need to add the interaction. But let's just do that. Let's click it. Okay, nothing's happening. And that's because I need to refer to this dialogue in that interaction. Let's call this dialogue D workshop. Okay. And when I go back to the global script, when we write, when we click the, the dialogue interaction um, cursor on not Roger, we're going to start the D workshop dialogue. So D workshop start. Okay. We can choose that up from up here, or we can cycle through with the right hand mouse button. Hello, our, our, our character says, and Haya is what not Roger says. We can do that again. You can see the, the dialogue colors are accurately reflected in the settings that we've done, we've, we've selected. But that's not really a dialogue. We're gonna we want to create some dialogue options and, th and things that they can say. We're gonna create a new option, and let's say one of our options would be, um, "What are you doing? Doing here?" If that's if that uh, if that's in there, then you can see how the option we have now have this one that is populated, and we can say, um, "No, not Roger can reply to that." as I'm helping with this workshop. Okay, there are some um, 
options here. There's a show and there's a say along uh, that go alongside with, and they're both default is being checked off. The option text, what are you doing here? If I keep this checked, then we will see our character, Roger, say this line. And then see not Roger will say, I am helping with this workshop. If we don't have this selected, then um, he won't, sorry, the say, he won't um, say the line, but it will display on the screen. Um, so let's see what that looks like. I'll show, actually show both really quickly. Here is our guy. We're going to talk. Hello. Hiya. What are you doing here? I'm helping with this workshop. Okay. But um, we don't have any uh, uh, like real options here. And I think we need choices for those options to, for the choices to show up. Um, our second choice would be this is a second. This is a second choice. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. Hello. Hiya. Okay. I'm going to just move this. Oh, I don't want to do that. I can move this up a bit. I know like my captions are going to be um, hiding this a little bit. Let's see if I can, I can resize. Okay. I can resize. That says that helps a little bit. Okay. So here are the options. What are you doing here? So we'll have him say, what are you doing here? And then I'm helping with this workshop. And this is a second choice and there is no other option. And there's also no option to leave, which is also kind of important when you have a dialogue, you want to be able to stop the dialogue. If I was to unblock, uh, uncheck the say here, then yeah, pretty self-explanatorily, um, Roger will actually not say the line, but it will be shown. Hello. Hiya. If I select, what are you doing here? If I select, what are you doing here? Then we don't say the line, but the other character responds as if we had said it. Um, so that is an option. And this one here, if you don't show it and you just say it, I, I don't even think that, I don't even think this is going to do anything significant because then the option won't even show up, but let's see. Hello, hello, yeah. This is a second choice. So that it just completely bypasses that dialogue choice. Okay. And now, yeah, we're going to want to stop the conversation, which is kind of important, um, which we can do by, instead of making this, this line say return, this line of code, we can have it say stop. Okay. Here we go. Hello. Hi. Uh, this is a second choice. And, oh, you know what? Okay. I need to have that other... The other option here you can see they just completely quit out of that <laughs> dialogue and it's not exactly what i was trying to demonstrate so let's give that a second try okay so we can have it uh let's resize this okay have him talk hello hiya what are you doing here i'm helping with this workshop this is the second choice and after that dialogue stops and we can continue walking around and doing other stuff, which is this. Yeah, here we go. So that is how to do basic dialogue in Adventure Game Studio. I'm going to close this because um, we're, we're done with this for now. But uh, let's let's continue to look at some of these um, room room um, uh, features. So we've done character. Let's check out objects. I'm just going to turn off the characters for now, but um, yeah, let's look at, there's no objects in this room so far, but uh, we can create our own object. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? Oh my gosh. This is what I mean about one take only. Um, I forgot to actually demonstrate the walk behind. So let's go back to the walk behinds. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, this walk behind, we're going to want to show the character walking behind this walk behind after all. And in order to do that, um, we're going to, um, allow the character to actually walk behind that area. Um, which in order to do that, we're going to need to expand our walkable area here like that. And then looking at the walk behinds here, um, 
one of the things, the other important thing with the walk behinds is they actually have, um, oh, wait, we need walkable area one again. Sometimes it's just a bit of, of a trouble to select the right thing. So you get this baseline here. And what the baseline does is it's explained um, here in this panel. Characters standing above this baseline will be drawn behind the walk behind, which means that uh, I'm going to set this at the bottom of this object, basically. And we're going to see what that looks like when Roger walks behind this. I'm yeah, <laughs> can't believe I, I didn't actually show what the walk behind does. <laughs> Hopefully everyone is still on board. OK, if we walk behind it. You can see he's walking behind that area. If we walk in front of that line, He's walking in front of it. So that's kind of a nice effect. But something to think about is he can walk through it because that walkable region is, it just will let him because we haven't designated anything else. If you want him to kind of not walk right through the stone sculpture, we can take a chunk out of that walkable area here. Walkable area one, walkable areas. Okay. You see, I'm using the rectangle, but uh, the rectangle drawing tool, and I'm going to right click and drag to define the area where I would like him not to walk through this this um, object. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. He walks behind it. He can walk around it, but he's not walking through it anymore. You can see. And if I use the arrow keys, it's actually it's actually clearer to see. He's not walking through the, the sculpture anymore, but he will walk behind it. Which is kind of nice. It gives you that impression that this game is full of physical objects. Okay. But going back, speaking of objects, going back to actual objects, we're gonna we're gonna take a look at that next. We're going to create an object on the screen. And in order to do that, you have to right click. You can right click in an area and it will give you a, a, a command that says place a new object here. We have a number of different things. We can designate what the image will be for the object. Um, we can uh, give it a name. I'm going to give this this called workshop object. Oh, workshop object. Also, we can decide whether it's visible at the start of the game or not, which I'm going to keep as true. Is the game is the object initially visible? Is what the explanation says there. And I'm also going to um, give this a different graphic. And I'm going to need to do that by I'm going to import a new graphic, a very extremely different new graphic, and it's going to be uh, this one. It's an inverted version of the mug, and I'm going to use the top left pixel for transparency so that it's a transparent item. And then I'm going to say that's uh, sprite number two, and I can designate this as image two, and it updates to this new object. Okay, uh, if I start this up, there it is. There's no interactions associate, associated with it, but we can easily do those. If I click on the events, the lightning button again, if we look at that object, this time you'll notice that the function is being created in this room because this room, this, this object is specific to this room. Oh, workshop object look. I can have it display a message that says, that looks like my top, but not really. We can do that, and you can see for 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 text for strings, I need to enclose them with the, the, the double quotation marks, round brackets, and end it all off with a semicolon. Um, that's the syntax of of this language. That's that. But I, if I want him to say something, I can have C ego say, "Wow." So let's see what that looks like. Okay. That looks like my cup, but not really. And then he can say, well, wow. those, the, those are the two types of display text. Okay, but let's say we want to pick up that object and add it to our inventory. The inventory objects 
and objects are different, but they, there's an illusion that they're the same thing. So hopefully that's not going to be confusing when I start explaining this. But let's say uh, we're going to add an interaction to this object, which is this interact object, which is what um, this template uses for pick up. We interact with that object. We want the character to walk over to that object first before he picks it up, which means we're going to say, OK, well, let's turn on the walkable area so he can we know where, where he stands with that. We can walk him over here. So that's about um, 80 by 144. We're going to want C ego to walk. And there's some, some uh, parameters that we need to set here. We're going to do 80 to what was the, what did I say? 164, uh, 144, sorry, 146, 80, 146 block and no block. Um, I'll explain what that means in a little bit, but we're just going to go with block for now. And then E uh, walkable areas are E anywhere. And that just means if Roger's going to, going to respect the walkable area bounds that we have set in place or not. And we're going to say that he does. We're going to have him walk over there. I want him to actually face the object that he's going to pick up. So we're going to say C ego face direction. And then say we want him to face upward like that. And then we want um, we don't really have an animation for him to bend down and pick stuff up because that doesn't come with a template. But what we can do is just as a placeholder to show what that looks like, we can add a new view. We're going to create a loop for that view, double click it, and we're going to choose a different, um, a different graphic. We're going to just choose this hand for his pickup view. This would be something you'd want to create yourself where Roger actually takes like kneels down to the floor to pick something up. Okay. So that's view three. Now that's going to be his pickup view. We can say uh, C ego. We want him to lock view to this other view, which is three. And then we want to animate him. In fact, you know what we can do? Uh, we can actually uh, animate cause the, uh, this can be the animation of him picking it up. And it's kind of nice because yeah, when you, when you create a new frame, the, the engine knows to advance it to the next sprite number um, for, for animations. Uh, you can see here, this first sprite is sprite 2108. Then when you have the next frame, it goes to 2109 and onwards. Uh, I'm going to delete these frames by pressing the delete button. But let, this will be our pickup animation for Roger. So just pretend that that's what he looks like picking stuff up. We can, we can name these views, but um, uh, I, I tend to just really, I only name them for my own purposes. and I don't refer to them by anything else. But... Um, Let's get back into the room. We're going to lock view. That's view three. When you animate something, you have to ha you have to enter some particular parameters as well. Animate. In brackets, we have a loop, that particular loop. So this particular, there's only one loop here, but we need to say what it is. We need to say it's going to be loop zero. Int delay, which is just how fast this is going to happen. So we're going to, why don't we say 30? Because I do want to see that happen. Um, that's not too fast. We want him to do it once. We want it to be blocking as well. And then we want it to happen backwards or forwards. This is this helpful is helpful more if like, you actually have him physically bend down and that's your animation. You can have him forwards could be him bending down to the ground. And then if you play that backwards then he'll come back up from, from the squatting position, which is, which is helpful. We don't really need that parameter. That's an optional parameter. So we're going to just end it at that. Um, after that, let's just see what that looks like so far. Okay, we know what if we look at it, that happens. Wow, if we try to pick it up, he walks toward it, he he faces it, and then that happens. That's the animation of him picking it up. But he stays locked as, as as this image, unfortunately, which is not what we want at all. So what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna have to unlock him from that that animation um, view, which the command being C ego unlock which just means we're going to revert him to his normal view release him from the, the specified special view something else we're going to want to do is if he's picked it indeed picked up the the item from the ground we're going to want that to not be visible anymore which means we want oh 
workshop object or O work. What did I call it? I don't remember. Um, let's go back to objects. O workshop object. That's what it's called. O workshop object. Okay. We're going to want O workshop object visible visibility to equal false. We're going to want it to be invisible. We're going to also have a, a, a description that says oh, display. You pick up the other mug. Okay. So let's see what that looks like. Okay. You pick up the other mug. And now the mug is no longer there. Oh. Yeah. So there it's gone. It's gone. But we had him facing this direction before. And just for continuity's sake, I'm going to have him face that way after his view has been unlocked too. We've had to pick up that other mug, but it's not in our inventory because we have to create an inventory item to add to our inventory. Right clicking the inventory items line here, uh, I've created a new inventory item. I'm going to call this inventory item other mug. I'm going to use for image, I'm going to use our other mug. An inventory in the inventory window as well, we need to define that image as well, which we're going to, I'm going to use the same one there. And it's, the, it's description. We can, you can call this, you can name it other mug here as well as a, just a, a description. And we, yeah, we don't want the character to start with this item because we want um, Tim to have to acquire it. And in order to add an item to your inventory, it's the command add inventory. And it's called I other mug. There. So let's try that. Walk over there. Pick up. You pick up the other mug. Check our inventory. And there it is. It's the other mug. We cannot look at these things yet. And let's, let's actually change that. I other mug has some properties of its own. Um, if we look at the inventory item in the inventory, we can have it say something. And we can have it say display. This is the mug you just, just picked up. Just do that. Okay, and I'm going to save it. Not only that, but I do want there to be um, a signal to the player that they've done something positive in the game. And, and one of the ways to do that is with giving a score, because the, we saw along the top of the game, there is a score. We can give a score. Give score is a function that's baked into the Adventure Game Studio engine. I want to give us five points for getting that, which is kind of awesome. So let's try that. Okay, we are going to pick up the item. Notice the score. Wait a second. You pick up the other mug. Five points. We look at the mug in our inventory. It says this is the mug you just picked up. Okay. This is a, a probably a good time to just show what the e block versus no block does. E block, it this uh, this the program will run this line until it gets to this area that we've designated 80 by 80 x 40 and 40 y but if you use no no block then all the rest of the lines underneath this will run before this first one is, is complete and i'll show you what that looks like we just change that to no block okay you can see I didn't, uh, the program did not wait till we walked over there to, to perform all those different animations and things like that. Kind of all just happened on that one spot. That's why most commonly you'll be using block, blocking functions for animations. Um, so that he, this will happen first, walking over there will happen first and everything else will happen after that.
We've given our player a score, but a lot of times these adventure games would have players like a, a chime or a sound to indicate you've done something well in the game. So we're going to do that next, which means we're going to need to go back to the audio area here, which is here. We can add a sound by right clicking and add audio files. And I do have a special chime here. It's an OGG file. OGG is a, is a um, open source file format. It's, that's why I'm using this one. And this sound is one that was composed by Dan Policar, who is a musician on the Crimson Diamond. So there we go. Triumphant score sound is what we're going to be using. And to do that, to make that play that sound um, work when we pick up our, our other mug, we're going to say a chimes underscore seven play uh, and this open and close bracket uh, open and closed uh, round brackets okay let's try that picking this up moving toward there that's the block function again here he goes animating him walking you pick up the other mug ta-da there it is in our inventory. Wonderful. Okay. Well, another thing to do um, with um, with with inventory items in these games is interacting with um, on other items of interest here. So why don't we handle that next? Going back to the inventory item other mug. What we can do is okay interact inventory item. Um, oh, you know what? Okay, first we're going to need to, if we want to interact with the, the glowing orb that's in this scene, we're going to need to deal with another room uh, room specific um, property that we haven't dealt with yet, which is hotspots. So let's do that next. Okay, hotspots. There is one hotspot designated here, hotspot one, which is H glowing orb which is, yes, this glowing orb here. There's no actions that are associated with it, with it, but we can create something. We can create an event for that hotspot. We can say use inventory on this hotspot. We're going to want to use the key for whatever reason on this hotspot, just as an example. Okay. And here is the using, um, using inventory on the glowing orb. We're going to want to check to see if the player is using the key or any other inventory item. Um, that means we're going to need to use C ego active inventory. And actually, this is probably a good time to check out the help here. I, I was mentioning um, right from the top that this this is very well documented help help areas in Adventure Game Studio. We're going to look at that. We're going to search for active inventory. Sometimes you need a um, just a a. Uh, a reminder of how to how, how the syntax works and everything but here it is character dot active inventory we could also have found this by going here character in the index active inventory and double click if you double click that it's going to take you there and the syntax for it is um gets or sets the the inventory um the active inventory the current inventory active inventory item and here's the example this will make the active inventory item the key, but that's not necessarily what we want. We want the interaction to be checking to see if the character has that key. But this is this is pretty close to what we want. So I'm actually gonna you can copy and paste these these code these lines of code from directly from the help. Okay, I'm gonna want if C ego's active inventory is the key, and the syntax for this is double equal sign for checking if something is indeed the case. In this case, if it is the key active, we're going to display on the screen. You unlock, you've unlocked the orb with the key. And in fact, we might actually want him to walk over there too. Okay. I'm going to check the walkable areas, have him walk in front of this, the stone bit to 165, 144. Let's have C ego walk to 165, 144. Blocking and walkable areas. I'm going to want him facing um, upward. 
There we go. You've unlocked with, with the key. And actually, we're going to use the same, the same code here, which is um, give score five points and then the, the, chime, the triumphant charm, uh, triumphant chime. But if, uh, if any other inventory item is being used, we can have it display. You don't think that would do anything. So let's just do that for now. Let's leave out the point stuff for now and just see if that has indeed worked. We're going to reach into our inventory. We're going to select the key. Yes, he moves over face of that and you've unlocked the orb with the key. Okay. Well, let's see what happens if we try to use our other mug with the orb. You don't think that would do anything. So that's, that's working all well and good. Now we're going to want to give ourselves points and a sound chime to celebrate that we've done something good in the game or correctly in the game. We could copy and paste this, these two lines of code down here to give us that same points and the chime. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to make my own function. So far, we've had the, the let the engine create these, uh, these particular functions for us um, automatically, which is really nice, but we're going to actually do our own. And I'm going to use, I'm just put that in the global script, which is I want this function that we're going to create to work in any of the rooms that we have. And what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to put that function, I guess, down here. I'm going to write function. And this is going to be give score uh, with sound. And the score is going to be some number that we're going to define with an integer, which is a whole number. So I'm going to put in here int points, curly brackets. And this function is going to give us points. We're going to want to do give score and then define by points, whatever number of points that um, the, we define in the script. And then we also want eight the chime to play, like so. And then we need to import this function into the global header, uh, which is over here. Scripts, global script header. And it actually says across here, if you double click the header, main header script, this will be included in, into every script in the game, local and global. Do not place functions here, rather place import definitions and define names here to be used by all the scripts, which we're going to do here. We're going to import this function. And now when we um, want to have scores happen and have that chime play, we can have now use our own custom built give score with sound function, five points. And I can actually put that here as well. Give score with sound. I'm going to give us three points for using the key on the orb. Okay, using the key on the orb. Wonderful. And he picking up, picking up the other mug will also do something. Wonderful. So that's our own special little function that uh, we can use in any of the rooms. The next thing that we might want to do is we might want to combine inventory items, which is also something that uh, that tends to get done in, in adventure games. In order to do that, um, let's see here. We have this inventory other mug. Um, let's see, interact inventory item, look inventory item. Uh, let's see, the cursor. I think it's going to be done in cursor. Use inventory on this item. Okay, if I'm going to use inventory on this item, let's do that. So I um, use inventory on this item. Okay. So we're going to do the same check as we did for using the key on the orb. If players active inventory, um, just I'm going to double check the syntax here. Uh, yeah, A equals key. Okay. So is I blue mug, I blue cup. We're going to say um, display you pour the contents of the other some of the contents because I'm not going to I'm not going to change that sprite you pour some of the contents of the other 
mug into the mug you started with. Okay, and then we're going to give ourselves more points. We're going to give ourselves another five points. Okay, and if we don't, uh, if we use any other item on that other mug, you pour some. Oh, sorry, uh, you pour some of the contents. I think I, I think I flipped it around. If you in other mug, use inventory on this item. Okay, no, no, no. Okay. I need to to change the writing just to, okay you. You pour some of the contents of the mug. Of the mug, you started with. Into, the other mug. Okay. Into the other mug, and if you try to use, for instance, the key, um, on on the mug, it will say, "Display." That didn't do anything. Okay, let's try that. Okay, we're gonna pick this up. Okay. Great. Now if we choose this and click it on this, you pour some of the contents of the mug you started with into the other mug. Yay, more points. Wonderful. And of course here we can use our key on the orb, the hotspot of the orb. Fantastic. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Let's see, what else have we got to, to go through here? Um, I'm going to close some of these tabs again because, yeah, they, they kind of... Um, after you have too many tabs open, then you have to use this drop-down menu to, to select them all. And um, sometimes I can forget that they're there. So I, I usually try to keep not too many tabs open at once. Uh, but yeah, let's take a look at that uh, first room again. Room script. Edit room. Okay. I think the last one we want to look at is regions okay here's regions when you go over to properties regions have fifth that same 15 uh, 15 walk behinds 15 walkable areas 15 regions um are what we're working with here although i don't i don't know about hotspots do hotspots have a, a limit of 15 no you're allowed to have 49 hotspots which i <laughs> it's kind of funny that that one alone is the one that you get more of but um, let's look at regions. There are a number of things you can do with regions. One of them that the easiest way to show what a region is and what it, what it could be is, let's get region one. We have light levels, which is kind of fun, especially with this particular room, is let's, let's create a region. And let's create a region where we're going to have the character being lit by the glowing orb. The default light level is 100 normal is normal let's let's have um the brighter 200 and let's tint the color as well and we can use this we can like maybe do a red tint or something and see what that looks like here okay okay if we walk in this region look at that we get the character gets tinted we will leave the region character goes back to normal which I think is kind of fun there we go so that's a real easy way to use um to use regions but I'm looking at the time and I think we actually have a bit of extra time to to actually look at other ways to use regions and I hope <laughs> I had a note for this but I don't I don't see it um with me at the moment but I'm going to give this a shot okay we look at regions in the help. Region. Okay. Okay. This one here. This is the key here. And I use this quite a bit in, in my own game. You can have the, the there's a this line of code here to say um, to check if the player is currently standing on a region, which can be very handy. I'm going to copy and paste this and I'm going to use it for my own purposes. 
So there's this region here, and we've defined it, but uh, let's say we want it to affect actual gameplay. And one of the examples that we have for using something on the orb is using the key on the orb here. So let's say we wanted to make the character need to be near the orb before they could even attempt to do anything with it. I am going to copy and paste uh, that line again. Index, okay. Uh, region. Region enabled. Okay, this one. Okay, so this one here. I'm going to say if region... If player, if region uh, get at room X, Y, player X and player Y, so checking where the player is, is in region one, this will all happen. Okay, I'm, I just, I'm just going to indent because I like indenting. If player is standing on this region, the interaction will actually take place. But if they're not, else else display you need to move closer to the orb before you can try anything okay there we go let's try that here we are away from the orb i'm going to try to use the key on the orb you need to move closer to the orb before you can try anything Okay, I'm going to move into the region of the orb. There in the glowing light. And now I'm going to use that key. You've unlocked the orb with the key. There we go. Wonderful. And I actually think that that is all the basic stuff I wanted to show. Um, all... All the, all the things that most adventure games would have in them. Inventory items, using the inventory item in a room, combining or using inventory items together, the dialogue, and, and all the rest of it. So what I'm going to actually do is I am going to go over back to that last slide and just talk through these other resources. As I mentioned before, Adventure Game Studio um, has a very active forum and you can download Adventure Game Studio and find a list of Adventure Game Studio games at www.adventuregamestudio.co.uk. Um, definitely check that out. There's an AGS Discord. Um, th there's a Discord invite that's discord.gg slash y, big Y, small b, small z, big z, 86c which this is probably, the link is probably also on, on the website as well. The AGS tutorial that I used was by Densming, D-E-N-S-M-I-N-G. And that is something that's on YouTube and is still on YouTube as of the time that I'm recording this. So hopefully it still stays around. If you want to know more about yeah, the, the, the this very start of Adventure Game Studio and the community and some of the community events that have been put on, that was a wonderful talk given by Edmundo Ruiz Ghanem uh, for Neuroscope 2023, which you can find on YouTube if um, you put those search terms into YouTube. The AGS licensing, as I mentioned, you're going to need to um, be mindful of the fonts you use. There was a time when using MP3 files would have been an issue because of licensing, but I think that is no longer the case. But definitely check up on that as well. And some other things about crediting people, like I said, about crediting people who, who created the modules or plugins that you might use and all the rest of it. You can find that on adventuregamestudio.co.uk slash site slash AGS slash legal. And of course, there are the commercially released AGS games that I did list. Let's just go back to that graphic again. The Excavation of Hobbs Barrow, Mage's Initiation, Lamplight City, Fairy O'Darles, Unavowed, Guard Duty, Beyond the Edge of Owlsguard, Nelly Kudalot, The Foul Fleet, and Perfect Tides. Um, there is a particular adventure game event that happens in London every year called Adventure X. That's something I would definitely recommend if you're interested in adventure games in general. And if you do eventually, um, it happens in um, usually the first week of November in London somewhere. And um, guaranteed you will meet other, um, adventure game studio devs, developers, and also other adventure game fans and, and, and developers of other engines as well. I would recommend that. 
And um, yeah, my game, The Crimson Diamond, which is launching in 2024. Um, hopefully you, you guys will check that out as well. There is a playable demo on Steam and on Itch.io and on Fireflower Games. Um, I think that's all I have to say, really. Um, I'm surprised by everything we covered here that uh, we got through all of it, And in fact. But um, yeah, if you have any questions at all, um, definitely check out check out that Discord, check out the forums, or even contact me. You can con you can find me at julia at thecrimsondiamond.com um, if you have anything specific you want to ask about it or other, other people. Um, th these other people, these other game developers as well, you can ask questions of as well. Um, it's a wonderful community. Part of why I would be reluctant to change my engine to something else is, yeah, I've met so many wonderful people through Adventure Game Studio and just having that with me and um, getting getting to take advantage of their knowledge and getting all their help. I would not have gotten as far in my game development journey um, without them, especially because, like I said, I've, 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 um, I've been self-taught. And if you're self-taught, don't be afraid of making your own adventure games. Give it a shot. Start with something small, which is, I guess that's another good, good uh, piece of advice I can leave you with. Start small, um, do something, do something with it, see what you think. And uh, yeah, share and let me know if you, if you do find this, this workshop helpful. And if you do manage to, to, to build something, um, I guess my last piece of advice is don't be afraid to not finish something, um, especially if it's a hobby or anything. Just the process of learning it is going to be a reward in itself. And don't be afraid of it not coming out exactly what you think of it, it's going to turn out. And don't be afraid of making your own art, things like that. I actually have a game art game art panel that I, I talk about that as well. But to don't let anything stop you. If this is something you want to do, learning while doing is the best way to do it. And Adventure Game Studio can be the way for you to try that as well. So create. Creating is a reward in and of itself. Um, good luck with it. Um, please let me know if you found this helpful and uh, see you. I see you. I don't know. <laughs> hopefully, see, hopefully see you around. You know what? Actually, one more thing. I, I stream on Tuesdays on Twitch at 8 p.m. Eastern, most, most Tuesdays. And if you, have, yeah, if you want to catch me there, you can catch me there as well. So I guess that's what I'm going to leave you with. Um, thank you so much again for listening to this. Okay.